and we actually have a busy day, uh, kind of a fun day. We wanted to squeeze in a, a, a few different materials. Some, um, you know, some we talked about in the last lecture. So all of them, to some extent, actually all of them, are uh, biodegradable, and we all respond to water. So the first one is a hands-on experiment. It will take some time, about 20 minutes, to shoot a time-lapse video. That's why you see a tripod on your um, that's yeah on your on your table. Uh, that's also why we set it as the first one. So the idea is you guys should kind of set this up uh, and you know let the uh, time lapse video going, and then we come back to the other two projects while you while the camera is shooting while we are waiting for the end result. So just a little bit about this project. Um, so basically. It's underwater morphing, morphing artifacts we are trying to make. And uh, they are some beads on top of a um, paper substrate. This paper is a special paper called vellum paper. It doesn't dissolve that uh, quickly underwater. Um, and I'll show you guys a video. Um, so um, there is this hydrogel beads we are going to use for this exercise. And this is readily available on Amazon. Perhaps a lot of you guys were into plants, um, you know, uh, growing your own flowers, have already used it before. So basically, it's the small beads in a bag you can see on your table. Can I borrow this? Yeah. Um, and uh, they are watering beads. I believe you search Amazon for watering beads. And on the left, again, it's a time lapse just to show the beads are, you know, increasing in volume dramatically as you dip it in water for some elongated time. It often takes uh, an hour or two to grow into that big. And it stores water. So it's a very uh, effective agriculture material. So if you, you know, you, you are away for a week and you want it, your plants to be keep hydrated, this is, a, this is a good material to put on your flower pot. And uh, it, it is a very uh, affordable and accessible, but it is also a very well engineered uh, hydrogel polymer. Uh, and it swells ready, readily, basically the water penetrates in due to diffusion and it, it swells and expands the polymer network and make it larger and it's gonna become softer. Um, and by the end, 90% of the volume is actually water. So that's the magical part of hydrogel and the medical field really like it because once it gets all swollen, you know, it's degradable, it's compatible to your body. Um, it's um, it, 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 the, the, the stiffness of it becomes kind of like a tissue. It's very compatible with surgeries and in-body injections. Some of the drugs are made of hydrogel because you can not only extract water in, but also you can absorb a lot of other functional particles into, into the hydrogel body. So it's used for drug as well and surgery, like I said. Anyway, we are doing kind of a craft practice in the lab, although this could get really scientific um, in, in yeah rigorous setting. So what we are trying to do here is um, basically super glue a bunch of these on a substrate. And then you leverage this bilayer phenomenon because the bees will expand. But the substrate, the paper substrate, the vellum paper substrate does not. So you are formed, effectively forming a bilayer. And if you dip it in water, um, you will see a bending phenomenon, right? This I repeated, I'm not sure how many times bilayer is really uh, one of the most classic trick of make things morph. It's just different material mechanism to make things bend. And the right figure is interesting. So you can see the, depending on the distance between the adjacent beads, you can control, you can use it to control the final maximum bending curvature. And obviously when the beads are very close by, they push each other, right, more readily. 
And then they will bend into a larger curvature shape. Or when you try to displace, distance the beads a little bit more, you bend less. And uh, in a paper we actually talk about, you can do this in a gradient way. For example, if you want a curvature kind of like the Rosa, the, the Rosa Jericho I talk about. So it's like starting as a, a much uh, smaller slope and gradually curls more. If you want to have a gradient curvature effect, you might want to play with the distance of the beads. Um, and ultimately I start at least for your very first artifacts you will make, try to just place them side by side then you will see the morphing effect much faster before you lose patience. And you can also think about the side of the beads. Uh, again, this is, this is intuitive to understand. If you just place the beads on one side, it forms just a cone, right? But at the bottom, if you start to alternate the size of the beads, they can, they can basically push the substrate up and down and form more of a wavy pattern. So you can play with the side of the beads as well. Um, so this was a part, 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 partly a publication we worked on. The focus is a computational tool. I figured it's going to be extremely tricky for us to set up the tool for everybody because we rely on some library. But I'll share the GitHub online. So if you guys got interest in this and wanted to try a more complicated shape and even run a simulation before you actually make it, um, that tool is available. And uh, in reality, right in the lab, I, I definitely wouldn't suggest researchers to use their scissors and hand to cut uh, just because it's very time consuming and they only give you that level of complexity. So, so the tool can allow you to export digital, uh, digital templates and you can laser cut, you can use the paper plotter to cut things uh, more in a more complex way. But we did talk about you could do branch, you could do kirigami, kirigami itself also afford more interesting transformations so you can push pretty far in terms of the geometries you can get. But in the class, we're just gonna try to use scissors to make some simple branch. It feels like a craft so far, but I think you can carry it further for more digitally controllable ways um, for more complex things. So this is what I said. So in the lab, one way to do it is to use uh, uh, the tool to design something, then use the paper plotter, cut it, and then you get a paper substrate and then you started to use a, 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 a jewelry tweezer to uh, distribute the beads one by one on top of the paper substrate. You need to uh, apply some super glue. It sounds extremely low tech, it is true, uh, but actually it requires some patience and dedication, especially when you apply the beads on the substrate. If there are too much super glue, super glue is stiff. Uh, by the way, if you guys don't know, now you know, super glue actually works extremely well underwater. The bonding is triggered by moisture. So it's in that sense very uh, waterproof. Um, but if you put too much of it because it's uh, rigid, the beads won't be able to bend it. If you put too little, the beads, as it swells, it's going to detach from the paper substrate. Um, so basically, you, uh, my suggestion is you try a simple, extremely simple strap to start with. I provided a paper template, right? This one. Uh, I'm showing it in front of the camera as well. So there are some patterns that are very complicated. Some are very easy. Well, you guys should start with the yeah three branch one. Um, I'm gonna. I said I would do a live demo about cutting out the paper template, but I'm not sure if I actually need to do that that demo. But my suggestion is anyway, each team only has. Uh, has one scissor, right? I would say, yeah, somebody volunteer. If you consider you are kind of a craft person, right? Like to cut papers as a kid, you can do it. You just volunteer yourself. My suggestion is just cut, cut out a small piece. You know, this is paper is only sacrificial. What we really want to use is the vellum paper, right? So, so basically, uh, that's the way I would do it. It's just, just place it on top of it. I will also try to cut uh, kind of a, you know, small piece out of the vellum paper. If you like, you can even put some super glue to temporarily hold it. And then I'll just cut out. So by the end, we want, we want the same geometry, ignore the beads. You know, the little purple beads are only for your reference. If you don't know what's the distance you wanna use, these are a suggested beads layout that will make sure to give you some good results. And, and then you just cut. If that makes sense. 
so I suggest um, I suggest again I suggest a volunteer who enjoys doing it um, to get started. And uh, the goal is to let you guys experience hydrogel performance. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no worries. Yeah, uh, try to get the camera on and uh, if you guys um, want to try right some creative shapes of your own as that as long as they are lightweight and branch looking it might work too try to uh, yeah yeah, sorry, we're working on trying to get you guys a better, better angle here. I've got, I've got a surface, so I can't tilt it down too much. Yeah, so for example, the if it's the branch, is this, uh, we are, yeah, just look at the project. This is the, the ones we, I think it's good enough. Yeah, we got, uh, there's like a, a water tank here, we got a we got bellies. We got, Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, okay. 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 Can we, uh, can we, um, suggest that if they had a simple one, we should try to suggest them to have a comment because it's going to be more interesting. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Try to time them for more complicated. Okay. Well, I guess it's not even possible for the audio. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Oh, no. So just the basic, this basic one to start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, oh, you're yeah. putting it on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. I think that's mostly green. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm like, did I put it in the middle or did you put it in the Yeah. Should I get the, should I do the component? Yeah, I suggest you try a complicated one, like those French. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. I'll take it over. I'll, I'll dip in the water. I'll try all the things. Yeah, I know, yeah. That one is too many people. Maybe this one. And these are different. Yeah, you don't have to follow all the things. I'm going to go upstairs real quick and see if I have cutting boards in the... Okay. Oh, somebody prefer cutting more? Yeah, I think a lot of people want to cutting more. Okay. Yeah. We got we got super glue the bees on. Yeah. So hold on for that uh, that uh, that uh, part. Uh, do some cut first, and the super glue part also has some tricks. Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, really? Yeah.
Yeah. What is this? Uh, keep it, keep it. That uh, would have been your note for this use. Okay. For the next exercise. Mm. But don't make it wet. <laughs> the, the game over. I, I use some super glue. Uh, so I'm going to play a video about that right after I finish my. It is, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. 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 All right, guys, uh, if you look at the project, uh, so this is uh, the one I did, uh, you know, it's, it's right. Applying this video now, if you guys want to take a, take a quick look at this, I think it's going to be practical. Practical for you. Uh, just make your life a little bit easier if you want to use it. It's a, it's a precision applicator. You can basically mount on top of the super glue container, right? And then you use this jewelry B, uh, jewelry tweezer. And uh, yeah, you get all the beads. So my, my suggestion is you can you can do a few um, at once, but don't you know apply all this all of the super glue position because super glue can dry. So maybe you can do like three or four at, at the at the same time. Really apply super glue to three or four slots and then drop the beads on top. Okay. Does anyone you want to use your thing? Yeah. 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 So I noticed uh, some team are already moving to the shooting stage. Great, you are so fast. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, I think um, um, just some photo trick, right? When you set up it, 
if you want a clean background, you know, you can you don't consider get a piece of white paper, right? Just um, place on the back. And also, this is just to show the left one is better than the right one. You might want to choose a proper angle so you create a magical effect, uh, right? Of a beautiful thing morphing without seeing the edge of this plastic container. Um, and you use the time lapse mode in your camera. But if the response is extremely fast, maybe you can just shoot a normal video. I also think it's a good idea you test, right? And then you might have some good idea. You might want to try the pattern of your own and try it again. Uh, I'll, I'll give you guys about 10, 15 minutes to play with everything. But the idea, the goal is to set up a time lapse so we can move on to the next assignment. Uh, come back to the, yeah, attention, come back to here. So we're gonna move on to the next practice. It's about hygromorphic wood veneer. And we talk about wood a lot. I just thought it might be cute for you guys to experience it as well. And um, a lot of architecture friends really like it because you know, wood, construction material. Um, and it's metal, it's a natural material as well. So just uh, very quick about some uh, actually mechanism stuff we discussed in the last class. So wood is extremely anisotropic in a, in a sense their mechanical properties are very directionally dependent because their fibers, their, 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 the wood cells are at all longitudinal and their fibers has a certain orientation. And along the fiber direction, you know, it's extremely uh, tough to tear it apart. Basically, if you, you pull it along the fiber direction, um, it's very hard to break, but if you do it perpendicular to the fiber direction, it's much easier. Um, and the fibers, if you think about how it affects the morphing property, it also affects. Um, and again, just imagine when water comes, water will fill in the vacancy in all, all those dead wood cells. And that will cause expansion. Expansion um, laterally to the cross-section, um, you know, um, cross-section side of the wood fiber. But along the wood fiber side, you still won't see a lot of volumetric change. So what I mean is basically, if you look at this top right image along this direction, you know, this direction, they all gonna expand. But along the fiber direction, vertical direction, you will not see much expansion. Uh, so that we call it anisotropy. And, and morphing for wood, I think it's well experienced in our daily life as well. Some of the old house, you see the, the wooden, um, wooden floor, they pops up, right? Your wooden door, when it rains, it's harder to open up. And that's all because the wood is, um, is getting, getting uh, swollen in higher moisture environment. And uh, arguably, if you pay attention, this all the, uh, basically the woodcraft folks know very well because they have to work with the fiber direction, the wood in order to prevent or take advantage of those swelling behavior. So if it's a piece of wood you cut in different orientation, uh, when the moisture condition increase in the environment, they actually get to morph in different ways. These are all to do with the fiber orientation and the relative cuts you, you are doing. Um, so we're gonna basically play with that in, in the very short practice right now. I'm gonna turn off the camera, actually. Oh yeah, thank you, Stephanie, for charging. So not turn off the camera, gonna stop sharing. Wait, can you see my hand? You can. Um, but uh, the folks online, can you see? You cannot see, can you? Maybe you can. You can see the demo, right? Okay, no response means confirmation. Um, <laughs> so you should have two pieces of wood veneer on your table. So we didn't sheet it, but you can sheet those. You can shift this in the, in the wood shop uh, at CMU as well. So you can see clearly the fiber orientation, right? Um, and the fun part is now I'm gonna show you, uh, literally you just uh, replicate my experiment experiences. That's the goal of this experiment. It should take five minutes. So I'll do the first cut. My first cut, I want it to be precisely along the fiber direction. I'll trim a little bit so I get the parallel line, right? I'm cutting this along the fiber direction. And then I'm cutting another piece. I want it to be uh, perpendicular to the fiber direction. You guys see the difference? You see, right? 
And then I'm gonna do another cut. This is a little bit wasteful, but just for the sake of demo. 45 degrees relative to the fiber direction. Diagonal. Okay, so now I'm gonna you all got like the water and free water, right? Let's let's try this. I mean, this is the most dramatic. This is perpendicular to the fiber orientation one. So I'm literally just spring some water on top. Um, and remember I said the wood will wood self expand, but the fiber is uh, limiting right the expansion along the fiber direction. Like in this case, because fiber is perpendicular to the expansion, so it's not actually preventing it from bending. That's why you are seeing a bending. You are seeing it, right? <laughs> and then this one, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is much faster because it's extremely thin. The hydrogel bead you are holding in your hand is actually quite thick. But all of them are the same, right? They are also all hydrophilic material. They, they, they extract water um, and then they expand. But this piece is not as bendable because I'm, uh, you know, passing it along the fiber direction. The fiber is preventing it from bending. And then this is uh, getting interesting. If you cut it diagonally, Uh, just wait a little bit. You actually don't need a lot of water because again, they're extremely thin. So the, their response are pretty fast. As time goes, just wait for a few seconds. They will start to form kind of a 3D helix, like a coil shape. And uh, these are all reversible. So if you leave the veneer in room temperature or under sun, you know, just for, for maybe 10 minutes, they will likely recover back. As they dry, they go flat again. So that's actually some of uh, the archetype usage for, you know, venting facade. Okay, now it's your guys' time to play with it. This should be extremely easy. And uh, no video needed, no side assignments, uploading needed, just play with it. Um, yeah, as you guys can tell, this is already a headache right now. So the last demo today, you are not going to have the hands-on experience, but because a lot of folks are very curious about morphing pasta. So I invited Melinda to Melinda is a research assistant in the lab. She has been playing with the morphing pasta recently. And I invited her to give you guys a live demo. And uh, you can see it from the screen. And uh, if you are just extremely curious and wanted to actually see it, <laughs> you can also welcome to come a little bit closer to her table. Either way, um, and uh, we'll get started. Alina. All right. Um, hello, guys. So here we have sort of the morphing pasta at all its different stages of like being made. So you start off with normal pasta dough. Um, there's a bunch of different ratios, but this one is just um, flour and water. Um, and so once you make your dough, you usually let it rest for a little bit. And then the next step, which I sort of have um, done already, but I have one that is sort of in process as well, is essentially rolling your pasta dough out really thin. So what you do is you start with your, your ball of dough. And this is just normal pasta making, by the way. Um, this is not related to the more thing. This is just straight up pasta making, um, where you take a somewhat flat sheet of your dough um, and then we're going to start, this pasta roller has different settings. So the higher up it goes, the thinner sheet pasta you get. So typically we'll start on one of the low settings. And what you do is you take it. <laughs> you don't do that. That you typically should not do. Um, and then you just feed it through the pasta roller. And so what happens is as you're feeding it through, you make it thinner. Um, but what you want to do is when you fit it through it also, like sometimes if you feed it through too many times, um, it'll just like start causing holes. So typically what we try to do to maintain sort of the ideal consistency and texture of the pasta, um, you want it to be sort of smooth, like your skin, that's a horrifying analogy. Um, but typically I'll fold it in half or I'll fold it into thirds, turn it 90 degrees and then feed it through again. And so this way, we sort of gradually make it a little bit thinner. So right now, I'm on pasta setting two. I'm gonna move it up to pasta setting three. Do sort of the thing we described earlier, where you take it and then you fold it into thirds, rotate it 90 degrees, 
and feed it through. And as you can see, this process is pretty simple, but it's a lot, a lot of manual labor. And that's basically it for the rolling step. So once I'm at three, I'm just gonna keep doing this until I feel like the consistency of the pasta surface is what I want it to be. So this is actually pretty good if you guys wanna come up and feel the pasta. Um, it's like very smooth. Nobody eat it. Yeah, <laughs> don't eat this. This has been places in the lab. Um, so typically you don't want it to have many bumps on it. Um, and so once you have a somewhat smooth piece of pasta, what you do is, I mean, I'll just portion off a little rectangle. And then you have to let this rest for a while. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put some flour on top of it. We are, we are cooking here. You layer flour on both sides, right? To make sure it doesn't stick to the board. And then you just let it sit there. And typically we let it rest for around seven minutes. Um, every 30 seconds or so, we wanna flip it to make sure it doesn't stick to the board. The reason why you want to let it rest, um, which we'll get to in a couple of seconds, is basically um, if it's fresh pasta and you're rolling it out and you try to press these things into it, it becomes very, very sticky. So when we want to make sure that it's dried out a little bit so that when we press these templates into it, we're not like making a huge mess and it's a little bit easier to pull the templates out. So this one, we're going to let rest for a little bit. This one has been resting for, uh, I'm pretty sure, over seven minutes, so it should be a little bit easier to press. Can we, uh, before you press, show you in front of the camera oh, yeah, how sure. the stand looks like? So, yeah. That's, wait, it's not the <laughs> okay, so this is a template. <laughs> It's a 3D printed template you can fabricate this in text bar. Yeah, but you, you need to use the highest quality printer. Um, if you use the normal one, um, it physically does not have the resolution to be able to print those edges. Um, so this is what the template looks like. It's basically just a bunch of groups. Um, and what this does is you have sort of the normal layer of pasta dough and then a small layer above it with the gears on it so as Sunny mentioned that forms a bi-layer um yeah. yeah and then basically what you do is once you have your pasta that's been dried out it's pretty simple you take your template i like to do this thing where i dip it into the flour and then shake it off to make sure it doesn't stick um and then you literally just press it down so i'm going to take this template I'm gonna find a spot on my pasta that's like big enough for it. And then you smash it in. So do not be worried at all about going through the pasta because the template has legs on either side um, to prevent it from doing so. And also the deeper your grooves are, the more actual morphing you're gonna see. Um, so you want to try to get it essentially as deep as possible without going through the pasta. And so, Basically, once I push that all the way in, I'm going to very gently remove it from my sheet. And just a small trick, with these templates, when you're moving them, if it's sticking, you want to sort of wiggle it in the direction of the grooves, so that way you don't sort of break the grooves. So in this case, if I'm pulling it off and it sticks, I want to wiggle it this way. Um, we have some that are like diagonal. And can anyone guess if I have diagonal grooves, what's gonna to happen to the morphing behavior of the pasta? Yeah, I see some people doing the thing with their fingers. It's gonna turn into a spiral, which hopefully we'll get ourselves one today. Okay, so I've got myself a little rectangle with grooves in it. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna cut it out and this part's very important. You want to make sure it doesn't have like flat edges. You wanna make sure that the grooving extends to both sides um because if you have like little strips of ungrooved pasta on the sides that's actually going to go against the morphing behavior like it's going to restrict the motion of it so when i cut this pasta i want to sort of make sure that the grooves extend all the way through horizontally all right 
And so we have ourselves a little rectangle of molten plastic. I can show it in the camera. Important is the beach you guys can see. It seems so simple, and you know, it took Manita the whole spring break to practice at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, half of it was the pasta making part. The pasta making part is also hard. Um, but if you're ever looking for something that will give you a good workout, but you also want to eat afterwards, this is a good choice. <laughs> because when you're kneading pasta dough, it takes around 30 minutes of the entire time you're just like pressing with your arms. So I feel like my muscle in this arm specifically has gotten like a lot better. <laughs> okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same process for the diagonal group ones. Um, so you saw I dipped into the flour earlier to make sure it doesn't stick as much. And I'm going to press down. So with the longer ones, basically, it's also important to sort of try to evenly distribute your weight along it. So you can, there's a, there's a lot of different strategies. I think everyone in the lab has a different strategy for doing this. Um, so my personal preference is using the tips of my fingers. One thing Leaning first mentioned when she was showing us how to do this was we have like this clamp in the lab where you can just put it in between the two things and like turn the clamp a little bit, but you have to be careful not to break the template. Um, so that's an option as well. And then one of my uh, fellow people who's working on this project, Neva, she likes to pick it up vertically and like, smash it. So there's a variety of different techniques that you can use and um, it's sort of whichever one works best for you. So I'm going to try to now pick this up without breaking it. As you can see that popped out really nicely because we floured it earlier. It's like normal cooking basically. Um, and then what I'm gonna do This is a little longer too, you know, this form the helix you use as that ratio wise, right? It might be a little longer. Mm -hmm. they're longer. Okay, so what you can actually do if you want to really force your helix, because um this is actually pretty thick, right? What I could do here is I can actually just slice it down the middle. And now each one of these I know is going to bend quite a lot. So usually these long helix ones have the ability to bend onto themselves at least a couple of times, which hopefully will avoid. Okay, so we have ourselves a couple of, a couple of templates. You want to, oh yeah, yeah. And once we have your templates, it's, Again, normal pasta, we have boiling water over there, like just, just a pot of water boiling. Um, this one, similarly to the hydrogel beads, also takes a little while. So I was thinking while these are boiling, if anyone wants to try their hand at templating some of these, um, just to get a feel for it, you guys can feel free to like form a line. Um, and so we have, uh, this one should be somewhat dried out by now. If you wanna try it, we have a bag of flour over here. Um, so a brave soul wants to come up and attempt to, you know, do one of these. Yeah, or who, ha who had experience 